teams all around the world started um, making their research on that. Some of them spoke probably too early, and some of them seems to have been mixing up two things. One thing is the scientific discovery, and something else is the production. If the whole world um, is willing to have vaccine uh, available and administered, then uh, one single plant won't be sufficient. And probably it's, it might be the case that the patent will be uh, universal, offered to the world community, otherwise some countries will not be able to access it. And then some uh, other plants will be uh, called to manufacture enough doses to have all those who want the vaccine, all the uh, medical uh, and other professional health professional to to uh, have it and, and the patients to receive it. Uh, so it's another question about uh, the production of the vaccine and the um, and the um, administration uh, of the vaccine. So Stuart Bloomer, you hear it? It's not one space race, but two. The, the race to develop a vaccine. I believe there's something like 76 different attempts that are taking place. And then the race to mass produce it. Yes, it's, uh, it's clear that when there is a vaccine or more than one vaccine, I mean, it'll take a long time before enough is produced to, to, to get it even to half the countries in the world. I mean, what we don't know, I think, at the moment is what kind of agreements have been signed between governments and manufacturers. I mean, I've been doing historical research on vaccine production. If we look back at the influenza epidemic of 10 years ago, we find that a number of countries, including most EU countries, had had uh, advanced purchase agreements with manufacturers. So they had first claim. We don't know if any such agreements have been signed right now. Another thing is the quicker the vaccine is moved into production, and there are obviously going to be social and political pressures to get it out at warp speed. The chance, the, the risk is that it's uh, too little research will have been done on on side effects in distinctive populations. Uh, we won't. Not only won't we know about the duration of protection or the efficacy, but we won't know whether there might not be groups that will produce bad reactions. That happened with some of the influenza vaccines in 2009, and uh, the, the, the risks in trying to move it along very fast. Yeah. So this is, this is again, we, we can't stress this enough, Yanis Natsis. We're talking about a vaccine that, well, may never be efficient, or as in the case of SARS, may never be needed. Uh, we don't know anything because, again, we're in an unprecedented situation. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. And at the same time, what is what is also very interesting now uh, with COVID nineteen is that we see massive public investment. I mean, we need to remember that innovation is always the result of private, but also public investment. And we see governments recently here in Brussels, we had um, a high profile pledging conference, a virtual one, where you could see governments from all around the globe pledging big amounts of money, considerable amounts of money. And therefore, I think their governments need to use their leverage to make sure that we get to this framework which will handle this scarcity of, of resources. 